<clears throat> As I'm sure you know, my title is taken from Julius Caesar, and I wonder what was in Shakespeare's mind when he gave Brutus the task of urging his fellow Romans to take the chance of murdering Caesar when it was offered. Was he conscious of what fleeting time, like the full surge of a tide, can offer us if we're courageous enough to take it? The powerful image also contains the fear of failure. Shakespeare knows of the doubts which can seize us at such a time, the regrets and the dangers. Certainly, it's a sensitive moment. While much can be said about the psychological tasks of young adulthood, and I gather you've heard quite a lot, um, I prefer to begin this talk right in the middle of things, in midlife. A sensitive moment in our lives, for in the middle of our life, we're afloat on a full sea, and we must take the current when it serves us. When I agreed to give this paper, fantasies of my fate and my limitations were abundant, even more than usual, particularly as I'm in the middle of my life. This was a challenge for me. It's one of the tasks of midlife to give up certainty, and in this paper, I look at the roots of the uncertainties which buffet us in midlife. These uncertainties stem from our attempts to deal with the changes in our lives, our bodies, and the world. Indeed, we refer, don't we, to the change, and that usage ref reflects the alterations in our bodies. We hear a good deal about the physiological changes, but far less about the psychological aspects of midlife. If we are to discuss midlife, then we need to make use of a concept like adult development, just as we refer to child development, and we have referred to it. However, adult development is not only in terms of psychological, is chronological process. It's also a development in terms of depth, of consciousness and understanding. Attempting to elucidate midlife may make it seem too defined and too clear. The experience is unclear, if at not at times obscure. Joseph Conrad called it a completely unaccountable phenomenon, but I think it can probably be described more appropriately in terms of poetry than in prose. Jung describes midlife as the moment of great unfolding, and indeed it was for him, and it may be for many of us too. It's just then that we possess the agonizing ability, like Janus and like Psyche itself, to see both ways, backwards to the past and forwards to the future, a future which contains our end, the end of our lives. The course of events is, at midlife, rather slower, perhaps even steadier than previously. But we can no longer avoid the fact that we're moving towards the end. Our mortality is hinted at in our creaking joints or in our inability to keep up with our juniors. Vague feelings of unease, possibly even disease, assail us. Where before we could live in the body without giving it too much thought, now we become increasingly aware of it. And if we believe the media, we're totally obsessed by it. We need to define midlife or midlife or adulthood a little more clearly. In measure of time, we might say that this period runs from our mid-30s to about 60 years. This is an enormous span, far longer than any of the other so-called stages of life and constitutes our most creative period. Since Jung's time, since his death in 1961, many social changes have taken place. However, sad to say, it's still external success that's the hallmark by which men and increasingly women are judged in our culture. Jung lived his personal life in a relatively parochial culture, although the ideas of Freud, Marx and Darwin were beginning to make an impact, an impact on the intellectual world. Social mobility was far more restricted than it is today, and the immensely rich and variable opportunities for movement and change, which are now available, have come about at the sacrifice of comparative certainty. But were we ever that certain, 
or is certainty itself a myth? Nowadays, our omitted uncertainties must add a certain frisson to our psychological anxieties. We can no longer ignore the outside world. Even while we analyze the nuclear explosions in our patients' dreams as indicative of primitive rage, we cannot ignore the very real threat from outside. Inner and outer inevitably reflect each other. It's only when we assume responsibility for ourselves to recognize our own helplessness and our courage to face uncertainty that out of such contemplation can we reach a sense of freedom. Today we're faced with choices and decisions which thoroughly test our hopes and our flexibility. But many of us cling to psychologically outmoded ways of dealing with things. In today's world, violence and ruthlessness have revealed their limitations. Jung is widely credited for being the first to develop a whole-of-life psychology. However, he paid little attention to add to childhood, and Freud was more concerned with the development of instinctual life. Jung saw life as an arc, beginning on one side with instinct and spanning right across the arc to spiritual life. While he divided life into four stages, I think his ideas need reviewing with some caution. All we know, life does not proceed neatly, with a sharp ending to one stage before another begins. Nevertheless, Jung pipped the Freudian Eric Erikson to the post when he stated that each of us, as individuals, has a series of particular life tasks to, to negotiate. It was out of Jung's own experience in midlife that he developed his concepts and theories of how to understand those inner processes which push us painfully and sometimes joyfully towards life. Our struggles and our attempts to find and to develop what has been forgotten in ourselves are not necessarily greeted with approval by society. Achievement and success are much more acceptable than recognition of difficulty or estrangement. Sometimes changes are precipitated by life crises which is impede or help the process, depending on the vicissitudes of earlier life experiences. Erickson takes a chronological perspective when discussing identity formation. But I think we experience ourselves in both a chronological and a synchronic way, partly through time, but also outside the time frame altogether. We know that in analysis, patients can experience an altered consciousness, an altered sense of time, a sense of moving in and out of time. I think we're particularly aware in midlife of this sensation, and perhaps this makes us long to hold on to something or someone. And then we're beguiled into thinking that evanescent things are solid. I'm reminded of Shakespeare's Prospero, who perceives that the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces and the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yes, all that it inherit, shall dissolve and leave not a rack behind. There's also the Hasidic tale of Baal Shem Tov, whose hero noticed that suddenly all the wondrous visions of beauty and marvels of gold and silver vanished. They'd all been conjured up by him, the all radiant master of illusion. At midlife, like Jung, we can no longer avoid conscious retrieval of corpses. Change is in the air. Pearl King, a psychoanalyst who works with older patients, once commented that in the past, Jungians were usually referred those patients who were over 40, whom Freud had considered too old for change. I don't think that would be the view of all Freudian analysts today, but I think it does point to a recognition of the fact that Jung had some particular understanding of the older age groups. Of course, he worked with them mostly. Certainly King, when talking of analyses of middle-aged patients, has noted, while negotiating the pressures and challenges specifically associated with the second half of life, such as the diminution in potency and occupational effectiveness, the key to understanding resides in the clinical insight that people function within a number of timescales. I go back to the, the key to understanding 
really resides in the clinical insight that function, people function within a number of time scales. These include not only the chronological, but psychological and biological, as well as dwelling in unconscious time, which is, as Freud and Jung pointed out, is timeless. If you can't hear, would you please let me know? Can you hear? Yes. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, in clinical work, we're familiar with the layering of time spans within the analytic hour. We meet with varying developmental levels and often can perceive great progressive or regressive swings as these are manifested in the analytic process. As we move into the adult part of our lives, it's conceivable that we may have developed well enough to re derive relative satisfaction from our chosen ventures. But though we meet the challenges of life well enough, there may be an accompanying vague feeling of discontent, a feeling of having missed out on something. Indeed, many of the patients who consult us in midlife are often precipitated into therapy by some major crisis, such as the loss of someone close to them. In my own practice as an analyst, I meet a range of age groups. Many of the people who come in the middle of their lives eventually realize that they're searching for something for something meaningful that they can't easily put into words, though they feel it's essential for their well-being. I would not say that everyone in midlife will be having their first experience of this, for some will have suffered for many years before their desperation brings them into the consulting room. It's perhaps a measure of difficulty in discussing midlife that Jung himself, in the opening phrases of his paper, Stages of Life, immediately ducks the issue. That was in 1930. And nearly 60 years later, we can appreciate that there have been considerable advances in the understanding of human psychological development. We can now talk of many issues which couldn't be discussed in earlier days. Sex is very familiar, even over-familiar, so that it's almost lost its charm. Death, on the other hand, is beginning to be the subject of everyday conversation in a way it never was before. In the clinical setting, we're aware that the life cycle is reflected in the particular transference dynamics. Certain issues may have to be developed. One of the most important of the issues concerns the unbearable recognition of aging and the need to give up some aspects of omnipotence and control. This often goes together with the difficulty of separating to ourselves from our children not holding on too tightly in order that they, like us, can get on with their lives. In midlife, underlying these problems, our patients are gripped by their struggles to give up normal adult idealism and managing the mourning process which follows. They do not at that moment recognize that they're attempting to deny, sometimes in a manic way, two of the fundamental features of our human life the existence of hate and destructive impulses and the inevitability of eventual death. They prefer to keep things steady rather than face the downward slope. But it's only when we can suffer the misery and the despair, the suffering and the chaos and the fears of abandonment as we take responsibility for our actions that we can begin to transcend the pain so that life can be endured. It's only then that we can take a more conscious view of different opportunities being available that we may find facing death more tolerable. In the pain and depression which is associated with this work, this is familiar to analysts. So too is the steady pace of work at this point. For though the depressive affect is uppermost at this time, it cannot be seen solely as pathological. On the contrary, Melancholia is intrinsic to periods of change and can be mutative when it leads, as it may in midlife, to maturation and to the flowering of creative potential. Indeed, we could hardly contemplate progression in clinical work in midlife or at any other time without the presence of some accompanying depression. This is true for the analyst as well as the patient and it needs to be picked up in the counter-transference. Change is important, for it's not only the patient that changes, it's also the analyst. <clears throat>
At midlife, the patient begins to the process of achieving an overall perspective on his or her life. And there are two things which in oscillation affect a person's view of their life. The first is the consideration of previous life experiences. And the second is where a person is in life right now. The liminal oscillation of these two factors is an attempt to reconcile opposites and to hold together the competing psychological poles of unity and diversity. It seems to me that the sense of being on the threshold, which is in the meaning of li liminal, occurs not once and for all, but throughout life, and in particular when we're attempting to come to terms with another view or experience. To some extent, then, the threshold of change is always present. And our fascination with liminality is reflected in our entire culture when we attempt to catch ourselves or encompass different views of ourselves in different dimensions of time and space. I think we can see this in the paintings of Picasso and in the films in Fellini and certainly in the time plays of Priestley. In 1930, Jung talked of problems which so-called consciousness had brought problems which no one wanted to speak of, problems which interrupt our wishes to live life smoothly. We want, he said, to have certainties and no doubts, results and no experiments, without even seeing that certainties can only arise through doubt and results only through experiment. Denial of problems will not produce conviction. Natural man and woman began a career of consciousness by eating of an apple from the tree of knowledge, so we're given to believe. And so they were banished from paradise forever. Humankind then began the great struggle, developing the religious instinct and establishing the sciences. Our earliest question, why, is provoked by our need to make sense of the world. We come to adulthood with the feeling, I am the captain of my ship and the master of my fate. This has a heroic ring to it, it's firm and definite, and it has a feeling of knowing who I am and what I want. But this is not the feeling of many of those we meet in our consulting rooms. If we conceptualize life as a linear process, progression without any regard for the diverse currents and powerful pressures which flow beneath, we will fail to see its complexities. This is a vital point to grasp when looking at any aspect of life. For it's only by looking at its dynamic depths that we can begin to understand its complexities. We cannot know when we may be gripped by some conflict which implies a need for change. We can anticipate some life changes, but not others. We cannot know with certitude how they will affect us. If we think for a moment of King Lear, how could he know that his neat plan for dividing his kingdom was doomed to failure because he'd failed to allow for the personalities involved and the turbulent and violent emotions of power, greed and jealousy he would stir. Without his kingly power, he was a vulnerable man and he could not easily change his view of himself. He expected to be treated with regal respect and hospitality, but unconsciously he was hoping that it would be overlaid with filial love and reverence. He was unable to give up his grasp of power and his control to recognize his human need for love and compassion. He was no more in touch with his own needs than he was able to understand those of others. His increasing vulnerability, uncertainty, disillusionment and disappointment and the onslaught of his worst fear and ours of abandonment led to his withdrawal into madness. In psychological parlance, his earlier psychological defenses, which had enabled him to carry out his kingly duties in a rigid, controlling way, were no longer of any use to him. The way he dealt with change in his life was uncreative, in fact, devastatingly destructive. It may be that many of the, one of the major tasks in midlife is to become aware of the oscillation from one point of view to another. If we try to ignore or bypass the threshold, we may indeed end our days wandering in the shallows. <laughs>
the search for identity does not end with adolescence. Throughout life, we're involved in the liminal process. Anyone with a family knows that attitudes have to be in constant flux to meet the changing needs of growing children. Increasingly, families are no longer central in the way that they were previously, and the different patterns of relationships are calling for new and imaginative ways of relating if the family is to have any meaning at all. All these complex embroideries and patterns of family life may change with separation, illness and death. We know that these separations may symbolize earlier relationship processes and similar identifications, which when they come into perspective, force us into painful readjustment. One of the problems, as I see it, is that while we might benefit from a clearly defined sense of self at some point, at another point, exactly the same self-image may be an obstacle to psychological progress. What is at stake is our capacity to react creatively to powerful ongoing psychic changes. In a stressful society dominated by competition, it is important to be aware of the struggles of those who are crossing particular thresholds in their life. Luigi Zoya, an Italian Jungian analyst, has suggested that the Freudian Weltanschauung has exerted influence indirectly by centering psychic life on and around sexuality, which in turn is biologically and archetypally linked with youth. Here, perhaps Jung has a wider view. Although he by no means ignores sexuality, he emphasizes the creative psyche. Our culture tends to view old and young, senex and puer, as social, political, rather than psychological categories. In Zoya's words, analytic work is concerned with the old and young as intrapersonal, not chronological polarities. And when these are emphasized as interpersonal, the individual is inevitably regarded as belonging either to one or another. This may do even more harm to the psyche to see us as divided rather than encompassing both aspects in a pluralistic way, for instance, as we do in masculine and feminine. The rapid changes in our world and the ensuing fluctuating uncertainties increase our anxieties and put further pressure on our needs for consciousness. This is not to say that in former times pain and disillusionment associated with change were easy to manage. In fact, we've only to look at the literary achievements of our culture to know that the great issues of life were torments for all generations. The great middle life plays of Shakespeare, Hamlet, Macbeth, Lear, and Julius Caesar, which I've mentioned in this paper, show the importance of the themes of power, loss, and change, and their accompanying depression. In primitive societies, important transitions in life, such as birth, entry to adulthood, marriage, and death, are marked by special ceremonies or rituals which are celebrated by the whole group. This enables value and recognition to be experienced and shared, supporting the individual's movement from one stage to another. I've come to think that the importance of managing the necessary movement in our lives is more urgent than ever in midlife. This is because the changes of midlife are relatively unmarked by rite de passage. In modern society, we have fewer rituals than before, but we do live in a world which has become conscious of its own alienation and stressfulness. Elizabeth Spilius, a psychoanalyst, has recently published a paper examining the importance of ceremonials and rituals in a Polynesian society in coping with primary feelings such as envy, greed, destruction and dependency. The ceremonies can lead towards the safe management of such feelings, converting them into feelings of interdependence, reparation, affection and remorse without acting them out. We have fewer ways in our society of handling this kind of transformation. And Spilius made a valuable point that rituals put a temporary break on a certain type of rapid change and allow the expression, and above all, the safe containment of contradictory feelings. <laughs>
We live in a world which values and develops science and technology, which had in its turn increased our ability and capacity for social engineering and material welfare. Rituals are considered old hat by many, meaningless and useless, but I think they're discarded at our peril. Violence, murder and rape, not only of the person but of the soul, are more prevalent. We are forced to look at ourselves more profoundly than ever. And as Rosemary Gordon has put it, the razor's edge between the sacred and the profane is challenging us daily. The challenge, as I see it, is to reassess and reevaluate ourselves as conscious individuals engaged in a search for meaning and personal identity. We need to develop ways of dealing in a symbolic way with our universal human experiences and our fundamental shared vulnerability. You may remember the prostitute in the film Never on a Sunday, who attended all the performances of Sophocles at, at a pederast. For her, attendance at the plays was a ritual. She knew them off by heart. Of course, the plays represent all the traumas of the soul in a dramatic form. The prostitute protested that she didn't understand them. But we sense that she knew them profoundly. She didn't need intellectual prowess for that. Can we take some comfort from the fact that the difficulties we have to surmount in midlife echo and mirror archetypal themes? Throughout literature, across the cultures and the religions of the world, we encounter themes such as a search for a straight way, for the path which has been lost. Many myths and fairy tales involve imagery of spiritual labor and toil, despair, horror, pain, and disillusionment. And as the protagonists experience the great lessons of life which have, been not, which have not been encountered or fully surmounted in earlier days. Empirical studies of adult development tend to be narrow and interestingly pay more attention to men than women. Such studies can illuminate into personal processes but they do not extend into the internal world. They tend, as we might expect, to evaluate adaptation to life in terms of cognitive development and psychosexual performance and identity. There are some who have a wider perspective, but I think others could probably be developed, although they're very difficult. Jung's work, however, complements and supplements the mainstream developmental psychology. He took a broader view, emphasizing impersonal and universal structures of the psyche. He paid more attention to the creative psyche. He comments in the development of personality that the middle of life is the moment of greatest unfolding when man gives himself to his work with his whole strength and his whole will. But at that moment, evening is born and the second half of life begins. He may now begin to take stock and see how life has developed real motivations are sought and real discoveries are made. To find a new center of their being in midlife is obviously as important for women as it is for men. We speak of it as the dangerous age, rather insultingly I think, as if it could be negotiated quite simply. We know that taking stock at this time may produce changes for which we're unprepared. The psychological relationship between spouses may come urgently in need of exploration. And the storm and stress of these years may seem like another puberty, as those who work in marital therapy will agree. Even divorce shows its positive side by opposing despair with individuation in new marriages and new lives and new careers for women and men too. For example, if we look at Nora in Ibsen's The Doll's House, we can see that some psychological development was absolutely essential for her once she could no longer tolerate a self-image as a doll-like person without a mind or thoughts of her own. Nor could she bear that her husband couldn't see her as a real person with deep and profound motivations, even though her persona was naive. In short, she had an inner potential for growth and development. Jung's need to develop his ideas out of the intense pressure and pain he felt after his break with Freud points up the importance of their relationship to each other. 
It was telling that the nodal point, which quickly led to their breaking off their personal relationship, revolved around Amenophis IV, although they'd had many disagreements before that. This seemed to be a nodal point for them. Um, as you may remember, or may know, Amenophis was Akhenaten, who was very interested in having a monotheistic religion and not a many-godded one that they had before. Um, the argument that they had was about the destroying, the far, uh, Amenophis' treatment of his father, because he destroyed the cartouches which contained his family, father's name. And Freud later complained that his own name had been omitted from the Swiss publications on psychoanalysis. Jung denied the assumption that Amenophis had been destructive because of his personal feelings for his father. The break anticipated, precipitated Jung's struggle for his own self, and the forces within him erupted. As I come to the end of these reflections, you may be asking what is typical of midlife psychology, of the so-called midlife crisis. It goes without saying there will always be individual aspects to consider, but I think there can be many things in midlife that can be regarded as typical. If we look at Jung himself, we discover that his life proceeded along the lines we might expect for an exceptionally intelligent man with an aggressive drive towards understanding and achievement. In spite of earlier psychological disturbance in his life, which he'd been able to manage, he now had a successful career as a psychiatrist, studying with some of the outstanding minds of his time. But it was in Freud, rather than Bleuler, his psychiatric chief, that he found a mentor of similar strengths and interests in himself. The relationship was intense, like father and son. And like any son, Jung found he had to stand by his own ideas as he began to diverge from the mainstream of Freud's thought. It was not only like an adolescent, but it was really like a true adult. He had to challenge Freud's view with all the vitality and anguish such encounters can engender. The importance of owning his own views in the sense of owning his own identity and not complying or comprising himself for father or the group eventually split them apart. This was the turning point in Jung's midlife. He suffered greatly and was plunged into a period of profound soul-searching. Deeply involved with his dreams and paintings, he analyzed them in an attempt to understand their meaning for himself and his life. The more he discovered what was behind the pressures that were invading his consciousness, the more he was able to develop his understanding. And as Satinova has argued, a vital aspect of Jung's self-cure was his elaboration of a set of psychological ideas and theories within which he was able to contain his otherwise overwhelming emotions. Of course, there are many defensive elements which helped to create the distance he needed during the most disturbed periods. It was Jung's way to play down the importance of personal experience in shaping personality. Rather, he emphasized the collective dimension of the archetypes. This ossified into the classical Jungian assumption that archetypal configurations can never be reduced to personal developmental level, the level of object relations. Today, we do not undervalue the importance of personal relations or shirk getting to grips with the infantile aspects of personality. But perhaps we may need also to recall Jung's seminal insight, an insight generated in midlife, that there is a universal seedbed in operation. I've spoken earlier of the shifting quality of the world in which we now live. When we think of in terms of psychological development, there is a temptation to assume that the external environment is stable. It is not. It is we, is not only we who are shifting in terms of emotional, cognitive, or behavioral and imaginative responses. The environment is also changing. For example, AIDS has had a cataclysmic effect, not only on sexual behavior, but on sexual fantasy. We can see immense changes in the roles of men and women over the last 20 years in Western society, 
Jung anticipated these in his paper on marriage as a psychological relationship. There has been a shift in our perception of gender which is no longer based on the platonic idea or myth that each sex is half of a whole. Nowadays we feel more comfortable with the notion that we contain both masculine and feminine aspects. Many people have given up traditional roles and see themselves as developing both aspects of their nature. This puts a further strain on heterosexual and homosexual relationships. I don't think we would necessarily consider that the second half of life as the only place we can begin our individuation, just as we no longer consider that it's only in adolescence that we have a second chance to find our identity. I think rather we're in a continual process of becoming ourselves from birth to death. Without the lead of an established religion to give us a firm meaning in our lives, each of us must find our, an individual solution. And although I've covered a wide range of issues which are pressing in midlife, it seems to me that the most vital is our development of consciousness. This means furthering our understanding of our depths and our needs to be aware, today perhaps more than ever before, of our destructive impulses, together with the importance of giving up omnipotence and control and to recognize our conflictual nature. Out of our struggles, some new and real fruitful change may come. Though the existence itself may be of meaning, may itself be a myth, I prefer to take a broader and more optimistic view. And I conclude by suggesting that we need not only be limited to recovery of lost aspects of ourselves in analysis, we can also think in terms of discovery of some of the reviving and expansive aspects of the psyche. Any endeavor that seeks to do this must commence with a commitment to search for meaning. There is indeed a tide in the affairs of men. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.